Hello, my name is Jeffrey Smith. I'm the Chief Instructor here at DTI. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, my trading resolution for uh, coming into the next year. Um, of course, before we get started, past performance is not indicative of future results. Uh, trading is risky. Nobody is ever 100% in the market. We do have losses along the way, so, uh, and we need to be aware of that. We don't want to be playing with uh, money that we use for mortgage or rent or anything like that. We need to have some disposable income that we, if we do lose, then uh, our lives can go on. So just be aware of that. Um, and one other thing, I am human. So if you see a typo or something like that, feel free to let me know. Um, I'm an engineer. I'm not a <laughs> an English major, so uh, just be aware of that. Um, a little bit about myself, for those of you who don't know me, um, I've been trading the market since about the mid-80s. Uh, actually, Pitney Bowes was the first stock I ever bought. Um, uh, dabbled a little bit in stocks, then got into currency bonds, uh, then started trading index futures, and then equity, equity options, things of that sort. Um, but my father went through the school of hard knocks, and he didn't want his two sons to have to do the same thing. So uh, he took it upon himself to teach us about the markets and he made us read articles and magazines and all kinds of stuff like that and then he uh, had a stockbroker um, who was Vice President Smith Barney in Oklahoma City. His name was Tom Busby who's the founder and CEO of DTI and uh, asked him to help him out. He agreed. We spent some time with him in his office learning the different brokerages and how they all work and things of that sort. And then uh, my father sent us to an investor boot camp in Provo, Utah, put it on by a gentleman named Howard Ruff, um, who had a magazine or a newsletter called the Ruff Times. And we got to meet all the gurus of the market and learn, you know, futures and stocks and charts and penny stocks and uh, all kinds of different things. Um, when we got out of there, he sat us both down, wrote us each out a check for $10,000, put it in a stock account so we could make money with it or not, um, and uh, he would never give us another dime, and he stuck to his word. Um, I went off, got a couple of degrees in engineering, was a pipeline engineer for about 10 years, but through that time, as I mentioned earlier, um, I was getting up about 3 o'clock in the morning, trading index futures up to about 6.30. I'd go to work all day get home in the evening, spend time with the family, uh, and kind of do it all over again. Um, I got into uh, trading equity and equity options um, in the mid-90s uh, pretty heavily. Uh, I think everybody remembers kind of the tech boom if you were around then. And uh, then uh, kind of migrated into uh, trading more of commodities. Um, and at this time, I kind of dabble in all markets, stocks, futures, options, commodities, uh, currency futures, currency CDs, um, all kinds of different things. So uh, I've traded in just about every market out there, but not every vehicle by any means. Um, and even on some foreign exchanges and things of that sort. But uh, I really uh, enjoy trading. Um, it's kind of a hobby of mine, if you will. Um, that's one reason why I came down here to Mobile um, in 2000, is because uh, I got to thinking, you know, how many people get to teach their hobby. And so that's what I do now. Um, I got to thinking about, <coughs> you know, what kind of a New Year's resolution to have going into the new year. Um, and I always kind of like to step back a little bit and say, well, how did the year go? What did we do this year? Um, and what am I going to have to change to go into next year? And we've had a lot of changes. I mean, if you think about it, uh, we've had uh, quite a few changes really uh, coming into the end of you no know, 2016, going into 2017. Um, first of all, the S&P Dow and NASDAQ have made new all-time highs. Um, in other words, they've never been there before. Uh, and, uh, no, they're up. But it's kind of interesting who's up and who's kind of up. The S&P opened up the year at 2038. Um, it's up 7% on the year. The Dow opened up at 173.47. It's up 9.5% on the year. Um, the NASDAQ opened up at 45.92. And look at that. Up a measly little 3% compared to the old Dow. That's one-third of the move in the Dow. Think about that. Um, even if you look at the Russell, uh, the Russell 2000 is actually up better than the three of these. Um, it's up somewhere around the uh, 13 14%. So your little small guys and your little industrial people are doing pretty well. S&P is kind of your 
an old big mongoid basket uh, of your Fortune 500 companies, it's doing pretty good. But uh, the little NASDAQ guys uh, aren't faring so well throughout uh, the market this year, even though they're up. So kind of interesting. And even if you look at the ranges, um, S&P's had a 411-point range this year. Uh Pretty substantial. Look at the Dow, 3,850 points this year. Uh, that, again, this is just from high to low. That's not just straight up, okay? Um, NASDAQ up 1,000 points, um, or actually has a range of 1,000 points. So pretty substantial. Um, but one thing that's kind of interesting, even though the NASDAQ's only up a little 3% on the year and stuff like that, all of them are trading in the upper third of their ranges which I always like to look at markets in thirds, even on a stock. Um, when you look at the range of it, you think, well, is it trading in the upper third, middle third, or lower third? Upper third is stronger. Middle third um, is trying to figure it out noise, right? And lower third um, is weaker. So if I see the majority of markets in their upper third of their ranges, then my initial thought is I need to be looking for buying opportunities. In the lower third, shorting opportunities. In the middle third, flip a coin. Um, kind of hard to figure that one out. So, um, but when we step back and look at the markets, we sit there and think, well, you know, we've been, you know, going up. It hadn't been straight up. And it's not only that, but we've been really moving up since 2009. Uh, when the S&P hit its low down there at 666, um, it's kind of taken off from there um, and been up to 2214, basically. Uh, a substantial rise from those 2009 lows. And we've had some bumps along the way. Uh, we had, you know, Greece kind of uh, giving the market some problems several years ago. We've had um, a lot of different... Uh, you know, uh, wars, uh, verbiages, and the people talking, um, economies doing good, bad, banks tr struggling along, doing good, bad. Um, we've had a lot of things. And then we've had a change of presidents. So, and a great surprise to many, I guess, uh, just listening to the news. Um, but now we have a new president coming in. And so now we have to kind to of reshift our portfolios a little bit based off of that. Um, you know, you could have the same stocks for the past six years, but now the question is, are those stocks good, right? And or are they bad? Or how is it going to be uh, uh, speculated, I guess is the best way of putting it, uh, when we go out and try to figure out what stocks should be do well in a Trump administration, or what stocks should be bad in a Trump administration. So <clears throat> here's the seasonality of the S&P. This is typically kind of what it does. Uh, it's had some pretty rough Octobers. Um, this is basically looking at an average closing price, if you will, on each week uh, for the past seven years and 20 years. Um, but October has a tendency to have some you know, some downs, uh, in which it kind of shows that in here. I think this is a little bit drastic, but it does have a tendency to do that. But notice it kind of peaks out in July, pulls back, but from really the, the middle to the end of October into December, um, has a tendency to kind of float higher. Um, once you get to January, and we've had some pretty rough Januaries, right? Um, it has a tendency to kind of pull down again, but it kind of bases out there in the January, February time period, and then kind of starts floating back up. That little uh, market, uh, I don't know, rule of thumb, if you will, um, up January gives you up first quarter, up first quarter, you know, up year, whatever it may be. Or if, maybe it's first week up, month up, quarter up, and the year's up, whichever it may be. But they, they, that rule of thumb is getting pretty beat up. Um, there's been some pretty rough Januaries that have been down, February been down, but the year's been higher. So um, I wouldn't really go with that anymore. Um, even the uh, one that says when in May go away, which historically is probably not a bad idea to do. Um, we've had some pretty strong summers over the past several years. Uh, not every year by any means, but we've had some pretty strong summers. So we have to kind of change a little bit because the markets are changing a little bit. So um, <clears throat> our portfolios of the past, as I was kind of mentioning, um, if you look over the past six, seven years, uh, your internet stocks have done pretty good. 
Um, this is your Amazons and uh, Netflixes and Apples. And I mean, you've had seven for one stock splits and Apple got above 700. Right now, it's still really, if you reverse the stock split, it's above 700 bucks. Um, actually, it's around 770 or something like that. Um, you look at Netflix. Netflix did the same thing. Um, Amazon hasn't done it, but it's still up there in the 700s. Google's, you know, split its stock, and yet it's back going back up to 1,000 again. Um, so you've had some really, really good rallies in a lot of the Internet guys. Um, you look at bonds. My goodness. Uh, uh, if you look at the price of bonds, not yield, but price, but look, look at yield too. Um, we've had the lowest interest rates ever. I'll put it that way. Um, we have never seen interest rates as low as we've had it. Bond prices have never been as high as they've ever been. Um, so we've had you no know, bonds moving higher. You've had internet stocks doing well. You've actually had gold and silver do very well over the past six, seven years, right? Um, and it now in 2012, uh, they started weakening up a little bit, but they've uh, done pretty well this year. Um, but the question is, is our portfolios of this year, um, is it wise to keep this kind of a portfolio? I would argue probably not. Trump won. Um, so thinking of that, the U.S. dollar is going to strengthen up. Um, you'll see energy stocks get stronger. Um, he's more of the fossil fuel guy. Uh, he's been promising to get coal back going again. Um, he wants to, you know, work on the trade deficits and uh, help manufacturing and things of that sort, which will strengthen the dollar up. People in a Trump economy, if he does all of this and people are working more and doing better, they're going to have more disposable income. Um, therefore, you're going to see restaurant uh, and entertainment stocks do better. Um, and uh, if he kind of rejiggles around the Obamacare um, to where insurance can go across state lines and open up, you know, the, I don't know, the health care system back to the insurance companies. And insurance companies should do better. Um, and just kind of showing you this a little bit, here's a daily chart of the U.S. dollar. Um, the, the big spike bottom low you see there, that's election night. Um, but since then, it's been moving up and up and up. It's at a 13-year high, to be honest with you. Um, here's Schlumberger Energy moving on up. Here's Darden Restaurants. Um, if you don't know who Darden Restaurants are, they own like uh, uh, Olive Garden, Longhorn Steakhouse, stuff like that. Um, they've been moving higher. Um, and uh, here's Humana Insurance been moving higher. Notice it was just going flat down whatever it was coming into the election. Since the election, it's gone from 167 bucks to 215. Um, we've seen a lot of moves in a lot of markets and things should continue in that direction in theory. Okay. So when we start looking at interest rates um, themselves, if Trump does what he says, um, the economy should get stronger. Um, inflation is going to pick up, which if inflation picks up, what does the Fed do? They raise rates. And if you're going to raise rates, that's going to push bonds, bond price lower. And we've actually been seeing that here lately. Uh, bonds uh, before the election were right around the 166, 167 area. That's the bond price. If you look at the futures, you can see that. Um, they're now down at 149. Um, so they've dropped quite a bit. Um, and uh, I put the market question mark. And the reason for that is that in one view, I'll put it this way. In one view, if the market's going to, I mean, if the economy's going to strengthen up, companies are going to strengthen up, things are going to do real well. So the market should move higher if companies are making money. There it is. But there's one thing that kind of hangs that's back in the, you know, my mind a little bit. And it's something that we're just going to have to kind of watch to see how it unwinds. I'll put it that way, especially over the next four years. Because if interest rates are going to go up, now let's kind of step back 
know, five or six years here, seven years, eight years. Back in the 2000s, 2005, 6, 7, whatever it was, interest rates were, you know, somewhere around 6%, 7%. You know, go out and get a mortgage, it'll be somewhere around 5.5%, 6%, whatever it was, okay? You could go to the bank and you could get a decent yield on a CD. And what a decent yield on a CD is, if you're trying to figure that out real quick, is the only way you can make money is that you have to beat the rate of inflation. There it is. So if inflation's at 3% and your CD's making 35 or 4%, you're beating the rate of inflation, so it's a good deal. There it is. Now, if you can get something better than, well, much better than the rate of inflation, that's fine. If you look at inflation at 2% and you can get 4%, that's even better, right? So <clears throat> the thing is now go out no go to a bank and get a CD you can't beat the rate of inflation so all of a sudden uh, all the grandmas grandpas moms dads who have money to park okay they really can't just park it in a bank because well you don't make any money you can't beat the rate of inflation so they have to put their money into something that beats the rate of inflation or gives them a decent yield so you have kind of two places to go well you have bonds well, interest rates are at the lowest ever, so bonds aren't going to do a whole lot of good. But if you are just banking on the price of the bond going up, you can buy the bond. It goes a lot higher. You can sell that bond to somebody else. Okay. So when we look at trying to figure out what to do next, the, the, the problem that we run into now is what if interest rates really do go up? And... All of a sudden, what's safe becomes enticing again. In other words, if I can get 5% on a two-year, three-year CD, why should I keep my money in the equity markets? That's very volatile, right? Though I can get 6% or 8% or 7% or 4% or whatever in investing in some stock, um... Why not put it into a CD that I can just keep rolling it and rolling it and rolling it um, and no, guaranteed not to lose my money, right? So at some point along the way, it might not be in the next four years, it might take it 10 years, and it might not ever happen. But if interest rates get up high enough, then the billions of dollars that have poured into the market are going to exit the market, which, if billions exit the market, what's it going to do to the market? Push it down. So I'm not saying that it's going to happen quickly. I'm not saying it's going to happen at all. But it's something that's in the back of my mind that I always have to keep aware of. So if we all of a sudden see interest rates start inching higher and higher and higher, and the market begins to weaken up, check out the, the, the rates on the CDs at the bank. Check out where inflation is. And... Uh, Find out if that rate is higher than the rate of inflation, because if it is, you're going to probably start seeing monies exiting the market going back into the banks, which banks should do better, right? Banks should do a whole lot better. So you can probably look at bank stocks um, and see that those are moving up as well. So I would say we probably need to readjust our portfolios a little bit based off what the quote-unquote new economy is going to be bringing us. We need to be looking at energies. We need to be looking at uh, being short bonds, if anything, um, or you can just be long the interest rate side of it. You can buy like TBT as opposed to buying TLT, right? Um, TBT is short the 20-year uh, bond. That's uh, an ETF. So we can look at, you know, restaurants, uh, entertainment. Um, we can look at the insurance companies and nothing's going to go straight up you're going to have to take a little heat along the way sometimes um, we'll see what the ups and downs does but the one thing i would kind of throw a little caution to the wind at the first couple of weeks of january over these past several years have been a bit weak um, so i would let at least the first couple of weeks of the year go by just kind of enjoy the new year if you will um, and then come in after the first couple of weeks and see how things are going. It might go up. Um, 
And just because we do have a new administration, uh, the market might like the new administration or not, uh, whichever it may be, uh, the markets always have a tendency to look out into the future. Um, they want to look out and say, hey, in six months, where do we think we'll be? Um, will we be stronger or weaker? Will we be up or down? Um, will we be having good days or bad days, right? So, and that's the one thing that the market kind of realized on election night uh, when Trump was winning. It sold off, and it sold off very hard. That one day, the S&P had a 138-point range on election day. Now, that's including the night market, um, which uh, the S&P futures, Dow, NASDAQ futures, all trade up and down throughout the night just because of the Asian markets and European markets. But for that day, the S&P actually had a 138-point day. That's pretty daggum substantial. The Dow had, what, 800 points that day? <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Um, so things might get a little volatile along the way. So we'll just have to kind of keep our eyes on how things kind of peel out. But I think we can start looking at, you know, those energy stocks and the insurance companies, the banks, the restaurants, um, even try to, you know, be long the dollar, if you will. Uh, there's a ETF for it, UUP, um, that's Uniform Uniform Papa, um, that you can kind of look at. And we might look at some other ETFs. I mean, there's ETFs on just, you know, the healthcare industry, on the energy industry. Um, and it might be easier to trade those than just trying to pick a stock. But I would kind of start readjusting um, my portfolios to agree with the new administration. And uh, I don't know if you know, there's going to be a lot of deregulation or not. Like I said, they can say a lot during a campaign. The question is, is can they get it done? And that's why I put this if at the very top of this slide in bold. If Trump does what he said. Because sometimes they don't. Um, that's a politician for you. So, but uh, anyway, um, <clears throat> if you're uh, interested um, in you know, kind of following along with stocks and things of that sort, um, I actually do uh, something that we call DTI's Trade of the Day. Um, I send it out each day right around 7 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes it's a little bit before, sometimes a little bit after, and that's central time. So it's about an hour and a half before our day market opens here in the United States. So you have more than enough time to see it, check it out, do whatever before you go to work or um, whatever it may be. Um, each day I will select a specific stock or futures contract. Now, if you don't trade futures, don't worry. Um, I always give you an ETF or something like that if I do that. I don't do futures too often. Um, I might do it once every couple of weeks just because something's moving. Uh, but I usually stick to the equity, and I'll always put out an equity option trade um, or a way to buy the stock uh, or short the stock or however we're going to do it. Uh, we'll look at support and resistance, um, and of course we're always going to be looking for buying or shorting opportunities at specific prices, um, and then we'll look to see what the risk is involved in the trade. Um, if it gets to a specific, uh, specific point, probably ought to just bail the trade, get out of the trade, whichever it may be. So if you're interested in that, um, you can join me for a week for free just to kick the tires and see how things go. Um, you can uh, use this link right here below, uh, and uh, it's kind of a long number thing, um, but you can use it, and uh, you can sign up for a one week of my trade of the day, and we'll see how things go. Um, I started doing this in July. Uh, July 1st of uh, 2016 um, up to current assuming one contract 100 shares or uh, you no know, a one lot of uh, options or whatever it is um, we're up uh, about $4,200 um, you started out with a $3,000 account which I don't think you needed more than that um, you're up around you no know, 7300 something like that so uh, it's never had a drawdown um, though I do lose. I'm not 100%. Um, we're going to have some losses along the way, but our gains outdo the losses. That's all we are concerned about, right? So, um, but with that, uh, give us a try. We'd be more than happy to have you in, uh, and we have a lot of fun kind of trading around a little bit. With that, you all have a great and wonderful day, and good luck trading. <laughs>